Welcome to Revelation Bible Study here at St. Paul. This is Revelation 22, the one with the epilogue. And I am Vicar Josh. I uh, host, teach, whatever you want to call it, this Bible study, and I have for the last many, many weeks. This is the last one, though. Um, in case you were unaware, Revelation has 22 chapters. This is the 22nd chapter, so this is the end of the Bible study. Um, but we're going to walk through it, just like we have every other one um, every other week. So, as we step into Revelation 22, this is this is the last chapter, and the, the penultimate chapter, the chapter 21, the one before it, we saw a vision of a new creation, and, and a little bit of what that looked like, and a little bit of what heaven is going to look like. And that's what we saw in Revelation 21. So in 22, we see a little bit more of that, a little bit more of that vision of the end and the joy that comes from that. But then we also kind of see a, a conclusion and a, a final statement of what we just read and maybe a little bit of what to do with this information. So that's kind of where we're going with chapter 22. But as as we always do, I want I want to jump into the text. Um, as always, I would recommend get your Bible out, um, because while yes, I have the text up on the screen, just like in a second, I will throw the text up on the screen. When I'm walking through this, it, it is really nice to have that text in front of you so that you can see, oh, I see what he's referring to, or, um, hopefully less of this, but, oh, I have no idea where he's getting that. So have your your bibles open revelation 22 it's it's uh it's near the back it's like the last chapter of the last book in the bible so easy enough to find or pull it up on your phone in which case you just like click revelation and click 22 um so that's what we have let's step in to the text and what we have is on, in verses 1 through 5, it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will the, there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So what we're seeing here is, is an image of the new creation, and in a lot of ways it's hard not to compare this to the Garden of Eden. All the way back from Genesis, I, you have this river of living water, and then you have um, you have the tree of life. And where's the tree of life? Oh, it's in the Garden of Eden. So there's this paradise where our, our first father and, and mother, Adam and Eve, walked with God. And we're seeing this final paradise, this new creation, where a lot of that is happening again. So as we step forward, it talks about this river of the water of life, bright as crystal. Um, water is frequently throughout the scripture symbolic of life. You have Ezekiel and Zechariah that both reference this in, in their prophecies. They reference this water as not only life sustaining, but actually healing and, and life creating. Um, and then also you have the script, you have Jesus in the gospels that speak. He speaks directly to living water that sustains body and spirit. So that's kind of what we're seeing here, and that it's sustaining the city, it's sustaining, and then we go to this tree of life, which is the next imagery that's here. Um, and this is, there are, there are so many questions about the tree of life. What is it? Where? What does it look like? What kind of fruit is it? I, I don't know, man. But what we do know is that it's it's kind of this source or this manifestation of the gift of eternal life from God. And in the Garden of Eden, God speaks about this tree. He said, that's one of the reasons Adam and Eve are cast out. He says um, they, they can't have access to this tree anymore. They are, they're fallen. They cannot live forever. 
so when we see this tree of life, it, it's sustaining eternal life. Um, and it's a manifestation of that from God. And this tree is reserved for the righteous, which if you've been following this study, we see over and over again, we see that the, the promises are for the righteous. And the pro this, this has all been a process of making people righteous through Christ's sacrifice. And those are the only people that are left in heaven are the righteous ones who have been made righteous through the lamb. So the tree is, is then theirs, is then ours. And what we see here, if we take these verses holistically, is we see God furnishing all that is necessary to sustain his new creation. And that's the incredible thing we see here. And it, it talks about seeing God's face and him being their light. There's this reality that this is paradise in the presence of God. And this is a really good passage to take comfort in when you're suffering or when you're uncertain, when you're struggling with anything like that. I think this is a great passage. The curse is gone. The curse that afflicted man and earth, it's no more. This God is giving spiritual light to his people to enlighten them, to inspire them. And this is eternity. They will reign forever and ever. We're, we're getting promised paradise with God where we're sustained forever to eternity. Like, there is nothing better you can promise. Period. End sentence. End paragraph. End idea. There is nothing better than this. It does not exist. So that's what we have. And then we step forward into kind of more of Revelation and in fact, Jesus himself speaking in Revelation, because we have in verses 6 through 11. And he said to me, and this is an angel speaking, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. I, John... And the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. And he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. So I, I misspoke a little. That was Jesus speaking there. And what this, what we're seeing here is a transition into an epilogue of sorts. The, the grand message of Revelation is done. Uh, this idea that God's creation is redeemed, it's saved, his, his people have been brought to himself. That's the whole point of Revelation. The whole point of Revelation is saying, like, this is the whole point of Jesus' ministry, of everything God's done in creation, is to redeem creation, to redeem mankind to himself, to bring us back into relationship with God, into a full relationship with God. And as to the fullness of the, that, revela that relationship, we can speak to that, you know, just with the environment we're in. We're in relationship with one another, but it's not a full relationship because we're not in person with each other we're not speaking face to face we're not in contact with each other we're not in the same room we're not in the same space but we look forward to a time when we will be in full relationship with one another when we have this relationship but we're also walking besides each other and that's a great analogy for what we're being promised here because yes we have a relationship with god and we're blessed with that but we look forward to the fullness of that relationship. And that is what we're seeing here. So this is moving from the finality of the new creation into an epilogue of sorts, where Jesus is, is affirming the truth of everything that's been said. He said, blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Um, so that's what we see here. And it says, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of spirits, has sent his angel to show his servants. So all of this is saying, like, all of this stuff that we just read and studied in Revelation, this is from God. It's affirming that again. 
And then it steps into this warning. It says, it's Christ saying, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. And this is a warning about Christ that we saw throughout Revelation. We see it throughout the Gospels where he says, I'm coming soon. Be ready. At any time, be ready. So that's a call here. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what it looks like to be ready as we move a little forward on. Um, so I'm going to put a pin in that for now, and we're going to step forward into John's comments starting in verse 8. It says, uh, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. He's reminding them who he is writing this. And he he's so overwhelmed by the joy and the incredible nature of the message that he's been given that he starts to bow down and worship the messenger. That's how incredible this message is. But just like what we talked about in 18, the messenger's like, no, I'm a servant just like you. Uh, sorry, we talked about that in 19. And, and just like in 19, I want to remind us that we have this tendency to praise the messenger, to praise teachers and pastors and everything else. That's not where the praise is for a good message, for the good news of the gospel. It, it doesn't belong to the people who bring us into relationship with Christ. It belongs to Christ. Um, and then it, it steps forward and it says... And, and that's in verses 8 and 9. And then in 10 it says, He's told not to seal up the words of the prophecy. To share them, to let them go out into the world. And this is opposite to what we see with a very similar prophecy in Daniel. Daniel talks a lot about the end of the world in the Old Testament, but he's told to seal up the words of his prophecy. And what John is being told here is, let the prophecy go out. People are going to continue living as they're living, but let this prophecy go out. Let the gospel go forward. Um, so that's what we have in verses 10 and 11. And then uh, that's what we step into kind of the result. We're, we're left with these verses that says that essentially the evil are still going to be evil and the good are still going to be good. And then we step into Jesus' response to that in verse 12, where he says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs, and sorcerers, and sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. And at the end of Revelation, this is kind of a, a contrast to the joy we see in these first couple of passages, because it's Jesus reminding us that he is, is coming again to judge. He is coming to judge the evil for the works that they do and the righteous for the works that we they do. And we say, but we're evil people. We can't be perfect. And the reality is that our works are made righteous in Jesus' sacrifice. That is, the ju that is what his judgment of us is based on. We are not righteous because of things we've done. We're righteous because of what he did. And to speak to the authority of that, speak to the power of both his salvation and his judgment, he goes into these titles. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And each of these, while they're, they're very similar and they're very uh, easily connected in theme of this reminder of infinity and his eternal magnitude, I think it, it steps beyond that. Because each of these is, is slightly different. Because we have Alpha and Omega, which is kind of, it's presented without context. And it refers to this reality that he is... He is the, the absolute beginning and the absolute end, and it speaks to he is before and after, he is beyond creation. And then we have beginning and end, he is the beginning and end, and this speaks to creation. He is there at the beginning, he is here at the end. And then the first and the last speaks to the church. So this is kind of three different levels that Christ is saying, I am everything. And that is the person who forgives us. That is the person who redeems us. And that is the person who judges the world. So there is no one who is exempt from his judgment or from the opportunity to be part of his forgiveness. Um, so 
that's what we have here. And then it, it goes into a blessing. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they have the right to enter the tree, uh, the right to the tree of life, and they can enter the city by the gates. So blessed are those who are in Christ and, and kind of cursed are those who are outside of Christ. But here's where I want to talk a little bit about the, the idea of acting righteously and about our, our deeds reflecting our faith in Christ. Because if, if we've accepted that, that Christ is our Savior, we've accepted that He is God, the Holy Spirit has worked in our lives, the natural response to that is to live in accordance with His will. Because we know that He wants what's best for us, so His law, His will, is what's best for us. It's not a burden anymore, it's a joy to live in God's will, to live as He has called us to live. Um... So that's kind of his distinction. We're not working for our salvation. We're working because of our salvation. And it's a little bit of a fine line, but I think it's an important distinction to make because our burden is not to save ourselves. Our joy is to live as Christ would have us live. So that's what we, we have in Revelation 22 up to verse 15. And then we go into verse 16 through the end. Where it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. So what we see here in the conclusion is we see Jesus claiming the, the message of revelation. The Spirit then calling the church and the faithful into the Word, saying, Come, listen to this message, live in this message. And it concludes with a dire warning. It says, Don't alter the Word of God. Don't add anything to it. Don't take anything away from it. Speak honestly to it. Um which is crucial when we're, when we're sharing it with friends and family. We don't take parts away from it that are uncomfortable, and we don't add things that make it more enticing. And in addition, for some people in our society, you don't add things that make it more uncomfortable because you have an agenda, and you don't take away things that are too gracious. Like, the Bible is not a motivational tool for you to use for your ends. The Bible is not something that needs to be rebranded. The Word of God stands on its own. Just let it stand on its own. Um, so that's uh, what it's getting at here. It's saying, this is the Word of God. This is the message of God. This is the plan and the mission of God. Let it stand. Let it go forward as it is. Um, and then it concludes. It says, uh, he testifies, says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This is an invitation, an encouragement, saying, yes, we want these things to happen. The second coming is something to be celebrated by the faithful, not feared. And here's a prayer for that. And then finally, it closes with a blessing. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Be with all. Amen. And... It's such a beautiful thing that it concludes with that simple sentence. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Because that's the point of, of these 22 chapters. It's Jesus. It's Christ. It's Christ and Him crucified for us. It's, it's the fall and, and our brokenness and our tendency to go away from God and God's efforts to bring us back to Him. And the ultimate joy of the second coming where we're brought, brought into a perfect relationship with Christ. That is what this entire thing has been about. That is our joy. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 
So that is that is what I'm going to leave you with, brothers and sisters. If, if you have any questions or comments, please comment below. If you have been really itching for those videos that fill in the gap between uh, Revelation 1 and 2 and then Revelation 12, they will be coming now that I'm not recording new studies. Um, blessings to you. Uh, if you, like I said, questions, comments, comment below. If you have anything else, comment below. I would encourage you to subscribe to the channel because there's a lot of stuff coming out, including uh, a devotion Bible study kind of thing with Pastor Andrew, devotions from Pastor Steve, live worship, and everything else we got going on. So subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, and with that, brothers and sisters, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.